eh, es profesor en la Universidad de Londres, en el Royal Holloway, eh, en el Departamento de eh, Políticas y Relaciones Internacionales. Él es un experto en, en UDRS, en postestructuralismo, en filosofía continental, en teoría política. Hizo su tesis con la clave, con el que tiene muchas diferencias hoy en día. Eh, y ha escrito tres libros, fundamentalmente, eh, uno que se llama Genealogías de la Diferencia, todos en inglés. Otro que se llama eh, Reflexiones sobre el tiempo y la política. Y otro que se llama La teoría política después de Deleuze. Y bueno, hay un, hay un, los que estuvisteis en el Congreso de Populismo sabréis, sabréis que, que este libro tan, tan curioso sobre, sobre la teoría política entre la abundancia y la falta sitúa a Nathan Wiener como uno de los grandes representantes de la teoría política, no de la falta, que serían los, los lacanianos, sino de la abundancia que serían los delesianos. Y nada, para no robarle más tiempo, le dejo que presente su, su conferencia sobre la, la micropolítica de las pulsiones. Os aviso que la traducción que he hecho eh, era de una versión previa, o sea que vais saltándose párrafos para ir más rápido. Me parece que empieza en el segundo, donde pone trips y a partir de ahí ya eh, tendréis que ir saltando como realmente podáis. Y muchas gracias. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Um, I hope that you can hear me in the back. I'm originally from the United States, and one of the skills we have is we can speak loud. <laughs> and I learned to speak slow, slowly as well, which is not something we normally are taught to do. Um, I'd like to thank Emma uh, for her introduction, for inviting me here, and also for providing the translation. Um, the paper that I'm going to present will track It is a, it's a briefer version of the, the paper that you have in front of you, but it tracks in the same order. So hopefully, if you can't follow the English exactly, you'll be able to follow it by the paper. Um, it's called the, the Micropolitics of the Drives. So, my aim in this paper is to elaborate a concept of drives that can suitably underpin an ontology and micropolitics of the self, taken from the German tribe and variously translated as drive, instinct, and impulse. The concept of the drives is theorized extensively along overlapping but certainly not identical lines by Nietzsche and Freud and continues to have prominence uh, in the more recent work of Lacan, Zizek, and Deleuze, among others. But it also appears within the canon of Western political thought, featuring significantly in the introduction to Hegel's philosophy of right, where Hegel maintains the, that the natural will comprising a multiplicity of conflicting impulses or tree, must be mediated and organized by a system of ethical duty into a rational second nature that raises the will to infinite and, act and actual freedom. So in Hegel, this is the role of ethical life, of the institutions of the state, which take, uh, which in, in, imbue uh, a second nature onto the self, and in this way orient the drives of the individual, which otherwise might go in all sorts of different directions towards an ethical, and that Hegel would say, a rational form of action and community. The concept of the drives may understandably seem antiquated, and its usefulness in any theory may seem discredited, on the one hand by Freud's own admission that the drives are, quote, mythical entities, magnificent in their indefiniteness, and on the other hand by the way the thesis culminates in Nietzsche's thought with the seemingly fanciful assertion of the will to power. Nevertheless, as I hope to show, the concept of the drives and the notion of the subject it entails can play a role in making explicit the political importance of micropolitics, or that is, of ethical practices of the self that are necessarily implicated in political life. Now, against Freud's idea of the drives as myths, which he offers in the new introductory lectures, Lacan highlights an earlier statement from Instincts and Their Vicissitudes, where Freud refers to the drives as conventions. Drives in this respect are conventions used to account for behavior that cannot be explained by observable evidence, nor by any conscious or unconscious aims or interests that might plausibly be attributed to a reflective subject, behavior that suggests instead hidden and internal forces of compulsion. This shift may temporarily restore some dignity and even an air of scientificity to the drives, inasmuch as their introduction is justified by the limits of empirical study, And this is, of course, the way Freud introduces all of his work. He will say that observation takes him so far, he can't go any further, so he'll make a wild leap of some sort, speculation, but he'll say a justified speculation. 
towards the death drive or towards something else, or in this case, just towards the instincts of themselves. Um, but it's only, he says, after going through the empirical part of his study that he will justify him making this move. However, insofar as the appeal to the, uh, insofar as this suggests, an appeal to drives as hidden causes, which is not actually Lacan's thesis, and Freud himself is at the very least circumspect on this point, it would seem to invite only to invite charges of a homunculus fallacy, of the person inside the person who's actually controlling the levers, and then the question is that person will have a person inside them, who kind of controls the levers of the self. If the drives are like little people in you, then what are the little people who are driving the drives? And we have a problem of, of infinite regress. What sort of account could the drives then offer to avoid this kind of, of, of regress? At the risk of appearing only to sidestep the issue by creating another myth or introducing an entirely new set of problems, I maintain that as an ontological concept, the drives should be taken to provide not a causal explanation of facts about the self or, or its world, but instead an account of the sense of both the self and the events in which it is implicated. It is a philosophical as opposed to a scientific speculation, if I may be permitted for my purposes here to treat science as a search for causal or explanatory models, formulated in reference to relations that seem discernible from within observable phenomena, but not yet demonstrable, and which in turn might aid in the developing the basic concepts of the science of those phenomena, but which for that reason is not itself scientific. This is indeed how Freud sets out the matter and instincts in his vicissitudes. Um, the drives are a kind of non-scientific concept that aids in the development of the science of psycho. Now the idea of sense, whose use here is indebted primarily to Deleuze, itself requires elaboration. Its meaning will hopefully become clearer as the paper progresses, but the following can be said at the outset. First, sense is an ontological notion. As Deleuze says, philosophy must be an ontology of sense that includes both the physical, such as the sense of smell or touch, and the ideal, such as the sense of a word or a concept and therefore concerns both a theory of sensation and a theory of meaning, even if sense is neither simply physical nor simply conceptual. Freud positions the drive similarly when he defines it as, quote, an endosomatic, continuously flowing source of stimulation lying on the frontier between the mental and physical. Drives to flee from danger, for example, combine physical sensations of shivers, palpitations, an empty feeling in the pit of the stomach, alongside mental anxiety and fear, while also being irreducible to these. Second, sense includes the notion of direction, which is explicit in the French songs and in the German sin, but can also be found in English examples such as the sense of history, which can be taken to mean the direction history is going. The drive's impulse in this respect establishes the physical and meaningful sense and direction of the becoming of the organism. Finally, the expression of sense, even while concerning real objects and states of affairs, remains distinct from and independent of the facts about these reference. Terms such as morning star and evening star, or Socrates and the gadfly of Athens, may refer to the same object but invoke completely different senses. Conversely, contradictory statements such as the tree is green and the tree is not green may express the same sense. As Deleuze says, both express an action or event of greening or becoming green. Finally, the phrase square circle has no reference, yet it still has sense by virtue of giving expression to an impossible object. All of this makes the relation between sense and truth uh, subtle and again very different from an explanatory or causal <coughs> account of things. Sense is always plural and perspectival and as such is a matter of a philosophical art of interpretation rather than scientific analysis. If drives do in some uh, respect explain why we are what we are, it is not by way of determining a truth that excludes all other possibilities as simply untrue or false, but by conferring sense in all of its diverse physical, conceptual, and other aspects upon states of affairs, even while the truth of those states remains ambiguous. Now, in Deleuzean terms, drives are pre-personal and impersonal and constitute a non-subjective domain. This domain is at the center of many critical attacks on Deleuze's philosophy because it is seen to do away with both the subject and the space of the political. <coughs> Building upon a misreading of Deleuze's concepts of imminence and university, these attacks hold that on the one hand, 
The self is reduced to a multiplicity of blind, incommensurable forces that leave it unable to unify itself as a subject. And on the other hand, that the all-inclusive nature of this imminent, impersonal, and non-subjective field denies the breaks, fissures, or negations that constitute the place of the subject and the possibility of change. In this way, and despite Deleuze's affirmation of becoming, the result, according to these critics, that becoming is reduced to a simulacrum of a fully positive and complete being, the subject is reduced to a marionette or a lifeless automaton. For those people who are familiar with this, and I don't know about their status in kind of Spanish language Deleuze scholarship, but this is what we get from Badu's reading of Deleuze, which is taken up by Zizek, which is taken up by Peter Howard, which is taken up by a whole number of other people who don't know what they are talking about. But it comes down to this, Deleuze has described this virtual domain that encompasses everything, and there's no breaks from it. It, it has a similar um, parallel in Foucault's scholarship to those critics who say that Foucault reduces everything to power relations, there's no escape from power relations, subjects are just determined by their power relations, we don't have a moment that breaks free of it, therefore we don't, you know, the, the, there's, there's the Deleuzean critic's version of that. All right. Often these interpretations, much like the critiques of Foucault's thought, go together with an assertion of a Lacanian-style ontology and politics of the subject of desire as lack, where the subject is conceived as the very fissure or gap within the otherwise wholly enclosed world of imminence, a gap that ensures the openness of this world and thus the possibility of difference. But this alternative of the subject of desire as lack and the red herrings that are used to support it misconstrue the central political point, namely that this pre-personal and impersonal field is fundamentally micro-political, and as such it is a place of transformation, but one where change is not construed in terms of breaks or fissures of something that would otherwise be closed. These same critics often dismiss the micro-political as a merely personal or aesthetic domain of self-creation. However, as I hope to make clear, it is a starting point for conceiving and acting and enacting political transformations, its non-subjective character being crucial to the way it impacts on the domain of political subjectivity. Now, when composing a paper, I frequently chew on the end of a pen. You probably do something similar. Such activity is indicative of oral drives that are constantly compelling us while also pressing against other drives, such as drives to think, fidget, concentrate, wander, get emotional, get laid, and so on. I am driven to chew, and this compulsion has nothing to do with any need, such as hunger or thirst, nor any desire, either for the object I am chewing or for some missing object for which the thing I chew would serve as a substitute. Indeed, it still compels me, even when it is no longer pleasurable. My, when my jaw aches with fatigue, but I still am chewing on something. In this way, the agency of the drives cannot be explained by the pull of desire. Rather, as desire, as Lacan says, is agitated in the drives. Every drive seeks only discharge, release, onto some object or other, though each also competes with innumerable other drives whose discharges are incompatible with it. Their force is their forces ever present and decidedly amoral. As Nietzsche maintains, a drive in itself has no specific moral character, nor even any moral character at all, and is not, necessar not even necessarily accompanied by feelings of pleasure or pain. It gains these only in relation to other drives that have already been baptized as either good or evil, or inasmuch as it is associated with characters that have already been given a moral sense of the society in which they are expressed. In the context of a certain kind of society, for example, drives to aggression might be considered noble. In another kind of society, they're considered shameful. But this means only that, at what Deleuze and Guattari call the molar level, or the level of the social machine, which they say emerges from the direct investment of molecular drives that exhibit certain stable properties when considered en masse, particular drives have achieved collective dominance in such a way that they impose a sense upon all the others. Ultimately, then, the sense of every drive is given only through its relation to a complex it forms with all the others. Now, if I manage to, com to complete this paper, despite the divergent impulses in me, it is because some drive or set of drives is able to dominate and compel the rest of my being to stay the course. 
It would be misleading to think that competing drives have thereby been repressed or excluded from the self and buried. Sometimes their energy has been sidelined so as to minimize their interference. In the case of my oral drives, I've found something onto which I can discharge them without this preventing me from concentrating and typing. I chew on the pen or on some gum or something that leaves my hands free so I can still work. But the drive doesn't disappear. I've just sidelined its effect. In other cases, a drive's force may be co-opted for the task at hand, as may happen with the competitive athlete's aggressive drives, hopefully, albeit hopefully, in a controlled manner. The athletes are always talking about how they have to use their aggression to their advantage. Right? Not put it aside, but find a way of incorporating it in a way that is controlled. Right? In yet other cases, it is simply by luck that a potentially disruptive drive is at its low point when the task must be carried out. Social mores and meanings, which as already mentioned are themselves products of the drives, also play a role. A socially ingrained sense of responsibility, for example, supports an organization of the drives that can accomplish the task of preparing this presentation, as does a sense of honor in having been invited in the first place. Add to this as I learn that I am in lying in the room where Ortega Gasset has lectured, and he is looking at me, is another reason to try and perform well. All right? But these larger social factors, the, these, these mores and, and standards and so forth, and, and social pressures, can only be effective insofar as the dominating drives in me can link to them, thereby establishing a correspondence and resonance between constitutive impulses that have no meaning in themselves and establish social forces that can bestow upon them a representational meaning. What is definitely not the case in the terms set out by this account is that an ego, an I or a subject standing apart from the drives, takes control of the situation and presses them into service. The I emerges, as Sartre maintains in the transcendence of the ego, where representation is a necessary part of a process that constitutes the drives in an enduring disposition. Insofar as preparing the paper involves a concerted effort that requires my consciousness to reflect upon what it is doing, the I appears necessarily to accompany the activity with the result that it is often mistakenly treated as the activity's cause. So one of the examples Sartre gives is that I'm sitting in a room reading and I'm conscious of the book, I'm conscious of the present, I'm conscious of the book, I'm conscious of my activity of reading, but there's no I present until someone calls out to me and says, what are you doing? And then I break from my activity and I reflect upon what I'm doing. I split myself into an observing and an observed consciousness and I answer back, I'm reading. Right? And then Sartre will go on to say that there are certain kinds of, cons of, of concerted actions that because they take place over time and they require a certain disposition to be maintained over the course of that time, they require a certain kind of reflection on self and the eye kind of appears in them. Right? Activities such as driving a car, for example, or learning to drive a car, or learning how to dance, or, or something else. Right? Even if there's no I that is doing the learning, there's still a way in which the activity of habituating oneself physically and, and, and corporeally into, into the activity requires this kind of reflection on what's being done, and the I comes out of that. So that's one way in which the I emerges. All right. um, alternatively, as Nietzsche suggests, the I can emerge as consciousness aligns itself with certain drives against others, so that, for example, it may seem that I desire to combat drives to smoke, but this only means that my intellect has become allied with and consequently is a tool of other drives that vehemently oppose the smoking drives. If I am to oppose a drive, Nietzsche says, it can only be if there is another drive of equal or greater strength in me, driving me in the other direction. And I associate myself, my intellectually, with the other drive. I identify with the other drive and my consciousness is aligned with it. As Deleuze and Guattari uh, hold, the complex of drives functions on the basis of the connections amongst the drives, but it is explained on the basis of the friction points where these connections break down, and the subject or I emerges by way of a consummation or reconciliation of the conflict that compels the entire ensemble forward. With all of my different drives, pushing me in various directions, yet somehow being linked together in their struggle with one another, 
somehow, overall, I end up writing the paper, as opposed to not writing the paper. I'm driven to write the paper. And it's not a matter of my choice, but when it's done, I find myself declaring, so that's what I did, or so that's what I wanted. The I is therefore not a chooser at either a conscious or unconscious level, but more of a dramatization, as Deleuze would say, or an actualization of the interplay of intensive impulses. It results from a synthesis of drives that, as Nietzsche says, expresses, quote, a pattern of domination that signifies a unity, but is not a unity. This is not a denial of subjectivity, of the acting, feeling, and thinking that certainly exist and through which subjectivity is introduced into the world. Rather, it is simply that these standard trademarks of the reflective subject do not find their origin in such a being, but instead in pre-individual and non-subjective conditions, with the subject itself being an appearance that is effectively along for the ride. On, the term, on these terms, it is not the subject who guarantees the openness of what would otherwise be a closed structure of impersonal drives. It is instead the structure itself that is open and that guarantees the possibility of subjectivity appearing. That was a drive. Okay. The thesis of the drives <coughs> reflects more generally a more general thesis that Deleuze draws from Nietzsche about the nature of force. Force, too, is a convention used to account for observable phenomena that cannot be explained by observable evidence. As Deleuze states in the early pages of Nietzsche and philosophy, quote, we will never find the sense of something, of a human, biological, or even physical phenomenon, if we do not know the force which appropriates the thing, which exploits it, which takes possession of it, or is expressed in it, unquote. Concepts of the thing and object in the physical form of the atom, or the psychological form of the ego, cannot account for the necessary relations these entities have with others, and so only become coherent when replaced by the concept of force. But as a powerless force, lacking efficacy, would be un and unable to influence others, would not be a force at all. The essence of force, like that of drive, is necessarily found in its dynamic relations to other forces. There is no force in itself, because what a force is defined by is nothing but its ability to affect something else. And that something else cannot be a thing or an object, because those things and objects themselves devolve into the concept of force. And so force is always found in its relation to other forces. The essence of force is its relation to other forces. Deleuze maintains that this dynamic involves forces being constituted by their quantitative but non-numerical differences from one another, with these quantitative differences determining the distinct qualities of related forces whose discharge against one another in turn establishes the sense of their struggle as a whole. And this sense, again, is distinct from the facts of the situation. Now, there are many things that could be unpacked here, including going slowly through Nietzsche and philosophy in those key passages, but I will skip that, and I will give you a different kind of example, which I hope is both more accessible and kind of more interesting and illuminating. In 1974, UK television host Michael Parkinson interviewed Muhammad Ali after the boxer was named Sports Personality of the Year in the wake of defeating George Foreman to win back his title. I hope all of you know the story of Muhammad Ali and what is known as the Rumble in the Jungle. There was a wonderful documentary made of it in 1997, amongst other things, but it's a famous historic fight. And Ali, who was 32 at the time and 10 years removed from his championship when he was from, from becoming champion originally, and who had lost three and a half years of his fighting career because he was banned from boxing because he refused to go to Vietnam, came back and had to defeat this thug named George Foreman, who was big, strong, younger, and seemed to just destroy everybody within one or two rounds. And Ali defeats him with a famous strategy called the rope a where he lay back against the ropes and let Foreman try and hit him. And Foreman missed him a lot of times, too. But Ali absorbed the punches by leaning back, and, and he taunted Foreman for round after round after round. You're not hitting. I thought you were tougher than that. I thought you, you're not even breaking popcorn with your punches. You're just a girl. And Foreman was enraged to the point where Foreman was worn down after three rounds. 
And then Ali famously starts talking to him differently, saying, this is the wrong place to get tired. Didn't I tell you, you can't, your hands can't hit what your eyes can't see? Didn't I tell you I'm the greatest of all time? As Ali says, it really is worrying to someone to beat them up like this and talk to them at the same time. Anyway, after he won this historic fight that no one thought he would win, almost no one thought he would win, Ali was the only one who said he would win. He wins Sports Personality of the Year. And in this interview, <coughs> Ali expressed doubt about whether he deserved the recognition. He, he seems almost sincere. Because all he had to do, he said, was, quote, go out and beat a man who had no skill, no class, the man fights like a woman, he's wild, no class, no science, and ugly, and I just don't know why they think I'm so great, because I beat George Foreman. Ten years before, when, when Ali was going to fight and then defeated Sonny Liston to win his title, he famously said, he's so ugly, he's too ugly to be the world champion. The world champion should be pretty like me. This is how he became famous and infamous. You know, in 1960s America, people, you know, black people didn't say this in America, right? Parkinson, getting back to the 1974 interview, said that Foreman couldn't be so disrespected because he had previously beaten Joe Frazier and Ken Norton, two men who during Ali's comeback had beaten Ali. And because Foreman didn't just beat those two men, he demolished and destroyed them. But Ali replies, no, he didn't. He just hit them with the punch that they didn't recuperate from. And then the audience laughs. And then when the laughter dies down, Ali says, quote, this is why the public are so dumb and ignorant to this point. Sonny Liston knocked out Floyd Patterson twice in one round. Then I fought Floyd Patterson twice and never knocked him out. But I knocked out Sonny Liston. It's the style. And that's the point one that any boxing fan knows, one that any sports fan knows. It's the style that makes the fight. The style is a matter of the qualities that each fighter brings to the competition. Two counterpunchers make for a boring fight. Two, uh, two brute thugs just hitting each other makes for a boring fight, but they hit each other more, so it's more entertaining in some way. Right? Two boxers who have a certain strategies, that can make for an interesting fight. A, a boxer and a counterpuncher, that's an interesting fight, but it's the style that makes the fight. Joe Frazier, the one who had beaten Ali and then been destroyed by Foreman, always fights going forward. He doesn't seem to know how to retreat. He doesn't even display the skills or temperament for it. He got hit, Ali says, and he doesn't. And I, he don't have enough common sense to say, I'm hit. I better back up. He don't back up. He gets knocked down. He don't have enough sense to say, millions of dollars are involved, my heavyweight title, I'm a little groggy. It's easier to get knocked down again. You need about 20 seconds to cool off. They can't think that much. So right away, he gets right up, and then instead of retreating, he runs into another one. He gets knocked down. He didn't realize, I'm lucky I got knocked down twice and getting a third chance. He gets up, and he runs right back into another one. He still hasn't woke up. Boy, I'm down for the fourth. He got knocked down six times on the sixth time he got up to walk right back into another one. And this is true. You can see this on YouTube, the, the foreman Frazier fight. They did fight a second time. Well, the first fight, it lasted less than two rounds, so less than six minutes. One and a half minutes into the fight, foreman knocks Frazier down. Frazier has a standing eight count. And he goes right forward again. Foreman just pummels him. And he doesn't retreat, because that's the way he fought. Right? Now, the fact is that Foreman beat Frazier. But in a sense, Frazier beat himself. Or rather, the sense of the fight maintains this ambiguity, because both these perspectives are true. But even if the truth lay elsewhere, even if it was Frazier who had won the fight, managing to get to Foreman first and knocking him down, in short, even if his style of going forward and just punching, even if it worked, it would not change the sense of the fight, inasmuch as the sense would be a matter of the way in which competing styles made the fight, irrespective of who actually won. By the way, I do like using this example to explain the beginnings of the master-slave dialectic in Hegel, because although it's not said in, in the phenomenology itself, I think it's implied by the fight. One of the uncertainties the master faces is, did the master win because the opponent gives up? 
So is the master masterful? And that has to be, that uncertainty is always there, right? Because the master never gets, re there's always the talk, the master never gets recognition because he gets recognition from someone who's weaker than him, who's defeated. But there's also the fact that the recognition is meaningless from the start because he didn't win, because the other one surrendered. He never had the, the opportunity to win, right? It, it's kind of the inverse of, of, of Bataille, Bataille laughing, and then Derrida writes about that, takes that up in the from restricted to general economy, right? The, the, there was no fight to the death because one guy gave up, so they never faced death. This whole thing depends upon a restriction of, the, of, what, the, of what is being faced, right? Anyway, to get back to this paper. <coughs> Ali himself was not known as a hard puncher and could not fight Foreman and a Frazier even if he wanted. But in his younger days, at least, he could afford to fight with his hands down and invite opponents to throw first, which made it easier for him to hit them because he was faster than them. Ali would dance around with his hands down. He'd invite people to hit him, and they'd swing and miss, and he'd hit him three or four times because he was that much faster than his opponents. The point, though, is that Ali's style both what he could do and what he could get away with doing, he broke all manner of, of traditional boxing rules in fighting with his hands down and dancing around and so forth, as well as what he had to change later in his career, because as he got slower, he had to win, he had to change his style to win fights differently. What, you know, but both what he could do when he was younger, what he had to change later, these were not formed in a vacuum, but resulted directly from relations of more or less with his competition, more or less speed, quickness, height, reach, and power. These are physical and quantitative relations, what Deleuze calls differences in quantity, that give rise to qualitative distinctions. But even while they are quantitative, it makes little sense to place them on some sort of fixed or numerical scale. What would it mean to say Ali is twice as fast as Foreman, or that Foreman punches twice as hard? For that matter, what would it mean to say that two fighters were equally strong or fast? These are at best statistical averages. They involve external standards of measure, and they abstract these forces from the concrete context in which they are exercised. Indeed, what is notable about the rope dope strategy that Ali uses against Foreman is that while Foreman wasted most of his energy throwing wild haymakers that hurt Ali much less than it appeared they did, Ali regularly hit Foreman with straight punches that Foreman walked on to that wore him down in a handful of rounds. Ali's punches didn't seem hard because they were just short, straight punches, but Foreman was moving forward almost every time he got hit. And you know, it's, it's, the, it's the speed of both, right? It's both of them moving together that, that creates the, the force and the impact. What that means is that in their respective styles and strategies, it meant that in, in the, what it meant is that their respective styles and strategies meant that in the fight, it was Ali who punched harder than Foreman. And this was because, once again, the style makes the fight. And so this is Deleuze's point, which is that if you're going to look at the, the, the relations of power between competing forces, we're going to look at them concretely within the context of their struggle, you can't enumerate them. You can't give this one a rating of six and this one a rating of four, because the way in which they manifest themselves is local to the struggle itself. A different example, which also works, is in basketball, there are people who are seven foot two, which is about two meter twenty, I think, who play like they're one meter eighty-six. There are tall people who play short. There are short people who seem to play big. Right? Their their actual physical size, so to speak, doesn't doesn't um, doesn't correspond. Right? And 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 it, it it says nothing to say that someone is seven foot two as a basketball player, right? Just as it means nothing in this respect to say that someone is six foot six, right? Like boxers, forces have their own singularity, but this is established through imminent relations since they find their meaning and sense only in the clash. This is the key to understanding both the relative stability of the arrangements they form and the way these arrangements change. As Nietzsche says, the stability does not result from any universal laws of motion or from some tendency of forces towards equilibrium, but instead because, quote, a certain force cannot be anything other than this certain force. It can react to a quantum of resisting force only according to the measure of its strength. Consequently, quote, a new arrangement of forces is achieved 
according to the measure of power of each of them. What this means is that however the struggle of forces works itself out, it must accord with the sense that follows from the way forces are reciprocally constituted. But as the sense is independent of the facts of the matter, this determination of forces has no predictive value. No one could have predicted that with absolute certainty that Ali would be foreman, and of course, almost no one thought he would. But once he did, the result made sense. And in a way, it seemed like destiny. As Deleuze maintains, destiny, the temporal aspect of the determination conferred by sense, which may be the same even for diametrically opposed states of affairs, accords very badly with determinism, but extremely well with freedom. And there is always freedom in the struggle amongst forces, because this struggle involves relations of domination, resistance, inequality, reversal, and transmutation. Far from reducing becoming to a simulacrum of being, destiny ensures that becoming, the condition for the emergence of subjectivity, always remains both open and expressive of sense. And that's the point. People know this, see this all the time. A sporting event takes place and somebody wins, even unexpectedly. But afterwards, it made perfect sense why, the, why one team won. Right? It does somehow fit. The other team made mistakes. Of course the other team made mistakes. Look at the way they, look at what their strategy was. Look at what they were doing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right? Look at the way in which the, their styles had to relate to each other, the way in which they clashed. Of course Frazier lost. He kept going forward. The same could have been the case if Frazier won the fight. Of course he won the fight. He went forward and he got the first punch in. Right? So after the fact, the fact, the result makes sense. The other side of it is it seems like destiny. We always have that. Of course it was always going to be this way. Of course it makes sense that this is what it would have had to be. Right? And that's a kind of temporal aspect of the, of the way in which sense is made. And as Deleuze says, this uh, idea of destiny accords very badly with determinism, but very well with freedom. And there is always freedom because this is, there's a Foucauldian uh, resonance to this point. There's always freedom because power relations always include resistance, because power presupposes freedom, because power, pres because power presupposes an openness. Right? Relations of power are never a closed system. There are always points of friction. To, to exercise power on another is to always presuppose their freedom to resist and to reverse, etc. Power relations are reversible for Foucault precisely because of this. Okay. At this point, I want to turn back to Lacan and to the concept of desire in relation to the subject and the drives. Desire for Lacan emerges when the individual becomes a subject by taking up the position of an I in discourse and using language to express its needs to others. This entails a fundamental displacement and exclusion, as language requires the subject to expunge the particularity of its needs when articulating them via universal signifiers. But it also transforms the articulation of need into a demand for recognition, indeed for love, from the other who would respond. So for Lacan, I become a subject when I become a subject in language, when I can articulate what I want in the form of I want this. When I'm no longer the infant who cries for food, when I say, mommy, I want. Right? I have a one-year-old. This is apparently happening. It's going to end, apparently, with some edible desire, which, you know, what can you say? What can you do? All right? What this will entail, as Lacan says, is once the subject is using language, there's a displacement that takes place. Because the, the subject, the infant, doesn't invent the language it uses, it takes the language that's there. So it has to take on, it has to be, it moves on to the terrain of the other. And as a consequence of this as well, the particularity of its needs is, is repressed or suppressed. Because in articulating, using universal signs, they, ha they have to carry a common agreed meaning. So Nietzsche himself says this about our experiences, our feelings, our, feel our affects of pain and so forth. Think of this when you go to a doctor. You can't quite find the right words to explain the pain in your, in your arm or in your leg. Right? Nietzsche himself says our, our, our feelings are, are singular and individual. But well, once we translate them into language, they no longer seem to be. Because in language, there's, something that, there's, there's, there's universal signifiers that are conveying it. So their particularity is lost. 
the universality of language also entails something else. When I say, mommy, I want something, when my son says it, it's not just a, an expression of a need to be satisfied, it's also a demand for love. Because mother's response is going to be taken as a sign, an expression of love. But, going back to the paper, there is the excluded particularity that began when the, sub when the subject becomes a linguistic subject, returns as an excessive desire due to the inadequacy of every response. Even if the subject receives everything it needs and demands, it continues to feel lacking, and this sense of lack implies that something is withheld from it. So, one of the things Lacan will say, and Lacanians will say, is that every reply, every response from the mother might be an expression of love, but because it's a particular response, it can never uh, live up to demands absolute requirement. Because it's not mom, it, it's not, mo mommy can't show me that I, she just loves me today. Love is absolute. But no act can, can show eternal love, right? It doesn't have the absolute, no, no response to my articulated means can satisfy the absoluteness that demand requires. So, no matter, even if I receive everything I need and demand, this is Lacan's explanation for why desire, as, as Freud himself says, is infinite. It's because even if I get everything I need and demand, I still feel lacking. But this lack, and this implies that something is being withheld. Why is it that everything I get, and yet there's something missing? <coughs> this something, this objet a, must remain nameless, for otherwise it would reduce to an articulable need or demand. If I could say what it was, it wouldn't, I would be able to identify it and, and find it, and it wouldn't be, I could fulfill, I could, I could satisfy the lack. Right? But precisely, it has to remain nameless, because otherwise it would, be, it would have already been articulated as something I would need or something I demanded. The result, Lacan says, leaves the subject not simply incomplete or lacking, as the place of its constitution is also subverted. That an objet a is withheld from the subject implies that it is desired and enjoyed by another who exercises a power of prohibition. This is where dad comes in. This is why my son is going to hate me, apparently, when he figures all of this out. So I'm told. I can hardly wait. The power of this other's transcendent law of prohibition prevents the subject from obtaining the full validation it seeks in the articulation that constitutes it. Or put differently, the subject is both constituted as a subject and subjected to this law. I become a subject by using language. I become subjected to this thing that I can't articulate but which seems to be denied to me at the same time. And seems to be prohibited at the same time. The result is a series of repetitions that reinforces this dual relationship this dual relationship of being a subject and being subjected, such as repetitions of love, where the subject seeks another to complete it, but this other is always inadequate to the missing objet a. The man who keeps seeking another woman and another woman and another woman, and, and each time puts the woman on a pedestal and idealizes her as the thing that I'm missing, the thing that will complete me. But every woman is just a person, like every other person, so will never live up to the ideal, to the fantasy. Right? And so I'll go, and I'll all be, I'll, I'll be reliving, apparently, like the, the love that I never really got in the first place from mom. So that's one form of repetition. Or repetitions of self-negation, where the subject prostrates itself before the other, before some authoritative other, in the hope of receiving acknowledgement, of becoming the object of the other's desire, of becoming the object of desire that Kojev, for example, says is the key to desire is recognition. Right? And I'll keep failing. And, and Lacan himself will say, this, these repetitions have a sense to them because they are repetitions of something primordial which was excluded from language, which seems to be missing. The lack it gives sense to the subject's history in all of its rep repetitive acts and all of its repetitive failures in all of the ways in which it seeks to complete itself in this endless task. Right? This, and that, that's, that's what it is to be a Lacanian, I guess. All right. Now, the status of this Lacanian subject, constituted on the terrain of the other, accords very much with that of the subject described earlier. That is to say, 
This subject, which forms at the unconscious intersection of, the, of where the self and the social structure meet, has only a semblance of agency, since its desires, demands, and even needs are never really its own. And once I step into language and I use the language of the other, even the needs I articulate are not my own anymore. Their particularity, amongst other things, has been, has been suppressed. But simply consider what you chose for breakfast this morning. If you picked what you thought you wanted, this was inseparable from cultur a culturally available spectrum of options of appropriate foods, not to mention the breakfast your parents gave you as a child, any bad experiences you had with some dishes in the past, all of which had the effect of aligning your drives with specific wants and specific possibilities. In the end, it's not you who are choosing so much as the social machine of which you are a part. And the same can be said of the most more profound objects of your desire, and the, including the lost something and the lost something for which they substitute. So we all know about you know, the socially constituted side of the things that we desire. Right? It's not we're we're told what we desire. Right? We are given emblems of what is desirable, and we also like have these. If you go to a foreign country. When I've traveled to Asia, it's been so difficult to eat breakfast because they're very heavy, like they eat rice and fish for breakfast. And I mean, it's something you, if you didn't grow up with it, it's perfectly normal if you grew up with it. So when you're choosing or not choosing, you're reflecting your culture. It's, you know, you're reflecting what's embedded in you from the outside. It's not your choice anymore. You didn't make the choice. It's the social machine that made the choice. Back to the paper. But does this point about desire and subjectivity fully account for their relation to the drives agency, given that the drives force of discharge is not engendered by any lack? Lacan seems to fudge the issue. Noting that the drives find satisfaction simply in discharge, but the subject does not, he suggests that this introduced an often unrecognized category of the impossible into the functioning of the pleasure principle. The drives indifference to the objects they affect suggests that this is not an object of need, but instead desires unnameable OJR, such as when the jives uh, shift objects, this necessarily follows a path taken by desire as it negotiates the prohibitions established by the subject's relation to the law. So the drives switch from object to object to object, but one of the things Lacan will assert is that they follow a pattern, and the pattern's going to be the pattern of desire. So it's switching from object to object to object along the path that is set out by the prohibitions. Right. A drive's force of discharge may be independent of desire, but it is nevertheless oriented by desire. And in this way, the drive is, quote, given the task of seeking something that each time responds to the other. That's Lacan, unquote. In other words, the subject is driven to what it desires. But this correspondence between the drives and desire is clearly not a necessary one. There's nothing that says that your drives have to take you to what you desire, that there has to be this correspondence between the object of desire and what, where, where you are driven, and what your drives are doing. Indeed, Lacan admits that the vicissitudes of the drives have no necessary relation to desire, that a drive manifests itself in, quote, the mode of a headless subject, for everything is articulated in terms of tension and has no relation to the subject other than one of topological community. The only connection between the drives and the subject is that they both reside in the unconscious. Right? Not, that they are not that there's a necessary correspondence between them. Desire is thus no more than a contingent configuration of the drives, introduced in the case of Lacanian desire by a linguistic and therefore social structure that compels the subject to take up a position on the terrain of the other. The result is a kind of non-reciprocity, whereby this exteriority of the drive to desire makes them at bottom indifferent to how, if at all, they are organized. But the subject would fall apart if the drives were not arranged in a way that could sustain a sense of lack or incompleteness. The drives can be doing anything, but the subject has to, has to is only a subject if the drives are organized in a certain way. If the drives are organized such that they revolve around lacks. This is Deleuze and Guattari's very point in Anti-Oedipus, when they hold that, quote, desire needs very few things, unquote, and that the sense of lack is a social product and a product of power. As they write, again in Anti-Oedipus, the deliberate creation of lack as a, fun as a function of the market economy is the art of the dominant class, 
This involves deliberately organizing wants and needs amid an abundance of production, making all desire teeter and fall victim to the great fear of not having one need, one's needs satisfied. To live in a capitalist society is to live in a society of abundance where you are scared to death that you will lose everything. Right? And that fear of the loss of everything, that somehow like the lack will return, is, is, is central, to Deleuze and Guattari argue, to, the, to what keeps a capitalist structure and all of its hierarchies functioning. Lacan clearly remains committed to this form of the subject, the subject structured around lack, and the structure of drives, of drives that that subject requires, as evidenced by his view of his own work as providing a foundation for the Cartesian subject, albeit in a way that leaves that Cartesian subject undermined, and by Lacan's choice of Kant over Spinoza at the end of Seminar 11, justified on the grounds of, uh, that Kant grounds ethics in a moral law, which means he grounds it in desire. The commitment on Lacan's part, however, hardly removes the contingency <coughs> from the entire arrangement. Go on to the last part of the paper on micropolitics. Deleuzian micropolitics rests on a wager that this structure of the subject is not necessary, that alternative formations of the drives are possible and perhaps even admirable not necessarily admirable. They don't necessarily romanticize every non-subjective formation of the drives, despite the fact that some critics say that, suggest that. This micropolitics, Deleuze and Guattari say, involves a strategic and experimental engagement with both the imminent social forces that bring an image of the subject into being and the imminent movements of deterritorialization that can engender something new. Insofar as the sense of any configuration of drives follows its points of strife, so that the assemblages of assemblage of drives works only by continually breaking down. Deleuze and Guattari argue that these formations have one dimension oriented towards stratifications. So the strata are hierarchical organizations that impose and operate on principles of identity, and that include the kinds of subjectification and signification that underpin the Lacanian subject. And they have another dimension oriented towards dispersive lines of flight that escape the strata simply by exceeding them. But these determinations are not mutually exclusive or simply opposed. On the contrary, micropolitics in the sense Deleuze and Guattari intend is possible because of a double conditioning between the stratified and the destratified, the micro and the macro, the molecular and the molar. Double conditioning in the same sense that Foucault speaks about in the first volume of the history of sexuality. There is a micro-political, the Deleuzian micro-political, sorry, can be considered a domain where ethics and politics converge by way of practices of self-formation. There is a micro-political task of forming oneself as a political animal that parallels the task Foucault identifies in his later writings on ethical self-formation. But this is decidedly not the task of forming oneself as a political subject, just as for Foucault, the task of ethical self-formation is not a, a matter of becoming a moral subject. Now Foucault's genealogy of ethics does involve a subject. Any moral code, he says, presupposes practices of the self insofar as the code implies a subject who relates to it through obedience or disobedience, thereby becoming either a moral or an immoral subject, which in turn implies a self-to-self -self relation by which the self fashions itself as a subject an I that takes up a position of responsibility in relation to the code. So the codes, Foucault says, pretty much rarely change. The ancient, the prohibitions of 2,000 years ago seem to just remain. We're not very creative when it comes to codes. But every code presupposes a subject that relates to the code. The subject obeys the code, it's a moral subject. If it doesn't follow the code, it's an immoral subject. And this, in turn, presupposes, and every society will have it, rules by which people become subjects who relate to the code. Right? This is, again, to refer to Hegel, this is what ethical life is supposed to do in Hegel. It's supposed to turn you in, and this is why ethical life is the precondition for morality in Hegel. There are institutions that imbue morality in you, that make you a moral subject. And then there are practices related to it. There are experiences in, in Hegel of the family of civil society, of the, quote, rational institutions of the state, there's a role played by patriotism, there's a role played by civil religion, etc. And every society will have these institutions. Every society, Foucault will say, 
has these games of truth with respect to the practices of self-formation, the games of truth and the rules of, of what self-formation is supposed to be. Specifically, they have rules concerning the ethical substance, the mode of subjection, the available practices of ethical work, and the telos or goal of, self, of the project of self-formation. What this means is that the project of self-formation always relates to power knowledge regimes. So I mean, this is the introduction to the second volume, the, those four axes upon which the genealogy of ethics will function. And they'll trace the differences in the ethical substance and in the telos of self-formation from the Greeks to the Romans so forth. And obviously the project, Foucault passes away, the project is, is incomplete. But that was the direction he set in the, second, in the introduction to the second volume. Nevertheless, as Deleuze says of Foucault, Foucault's excavation of these practices reveals, quote, a dimension of subjectivity derived from power and knowledge without being dependent on them. The fact of this, that the self-formation precedes the self-reflexive moral subject indicates that it must be of a non-subjective order. And the entire step back to this ethical domain would be redundant if the only possible outcome of self-formation was such subject. If we're going to talk about how the subject has to be created by practices, it would be completely redundant if the only thing practices ever created was a subject. If the practice, there, it has to entail that there are other possibilities other than just a subject that emerge from it, other than this subject related to a code. At the same time, the way in which resistance is embedded in relations of power means that every moral code is filled with points of friction and problematization where available social categories and truths are inadequate. The ancient Greeks, for example, encountered the problem of the morally ambiguous status of boys as the available alternatives could not be cleanly separated into right or wrong or good and evil. As Foucault has asked, doesn't the fact that the Greeks are always talking about sex with boys a sign that they are tolerant? And he says, no, it's a sign that it's a problem for them because it doesn't fit their moral code. The moral code doesn't adequately answer the question of whether it's right or wrong. So it's in the, it's in the, the ethics here is going to emerge where the moral code meets its limits right? in, in terms of, of social practices, in terms of, of, de of terms of determinations of right and wrong and good and evil. At those points, ethical practice becomes more subtle. Practices of the self become more experimental. The Greeks, Foucault shows, use the problem of boys and the codes, identities, and practices at their disposal to expand themselves beyond what they were, inventing new ways to relate to the other and to themselves. Their subjectivity, so to speak, was realized in a move away from being moral subjects relating to a code, because it wasn't enough to just be a moral subject relating to a code to answer what the problem that was created, that emerged. Their ethical project in this way becomes a micro-political project, reshuffling both molecular and molar levels of desire. So just think about the moments even in modern times where the codes come under stress. Like one example, with, which William Connolly, an under, my undergraduate supervisor, talked about all through the 80s and 90s in particular, was um, the right to die, which in America in the 70s and 80s was just condemned. Right? But it was clearly something that standard morality couldn't deal with because there are so many issues of human dignity and the right to die and like why should people suffer in, in terminal illness, etc., etc., etc. And so the code was inadequate. To, there was a problem precisely because the code was inadequate. And there are all sorts of implications about the whole issue of the right to die and how it affects our notions of privacy and the division between the public and the private. Assisted suicide, what on earth, you know, what on earth the act of assisted suicide is, right, and how it relates to, to, the, to a private realm and to a public realm. And it's an eminently political problem because something, you know, because it can, it, it can only be resolved through some kind of, of political settlement or quasi settlement or something. But if it's that, if, if it's same sex marriage, it's all these sorts of things where the code is inadequate, and that's where it becomes an ethical problem. Right? And the whole point is that an ethical problem cannot be dealt with by establishing our moral connection to our code. It has to be a matter of rethinking our, our relation to a code and not thinking of ourselves in terms of a subject relating to a code, but doing something. You know, that's why they're practices of the self, not practices of the subject. Right? Deleuze and Guattari's micropolitics 
Similarly, it starts from our already stratified and desiring selves and the codes, practices, and truths available to us and works to reconfigure both them and us. The experimental and political nature of this task makes it impossible to specify rules beyond the recommendation of caution and the warning that these practices could end up as cancerous black holes or in micro and macro fascisms. But however the experiments work themselves out, they are not a matter of subjective choice as they depend entirely on the existing structures of drives and desires and the qualities that emerge from their imminent quantitative differences so that we necessarily react to the stratified formations around us and the possibilities for destratification in a ways that are appropriate to who and what we are at the time. There is no, there is no um, Sartrean radical freedom, as Sartre gets you know, portrayed, where I can just suddenly decide to be a different person. Right? And it's not even a matter of choice in that respect. And whether or not people can change, as the losing Motari say, depends on concretely what they are when the problem itself is raised. So, just as Joe Frazier could only fight going forward, some people can't escape their stratifications. They're just stratified, and that's what they are. But being stratified, the losing Motari say, is not the worst thing that can happen. Regardless, what makes the choice, so to speak, in this micro-political project, they say, is not the subject but the body without organs, or the BWO. The body without organs is the point of tension at which molecular drives and molar social formations intersect, the point that faces the divergent dimensions of stratification and deterritorialization. And the BWO chooses, they say, in the sense of determining what can be attached to it and how, and thus what the self is able to do or become. But this determination, once more, is a determination of sense, not truth and thus it remains independent of the forms of change or stasis we actually realize while serving as the guarantor for the openness needed to realize something new. Indeed, the body without organs is a difference, and specifically what Deleuze calls indifference and repetition, a difference in itself. It is the very difference that makes the style, the style in turn that makes the fight, which determines the sense of what we become. And at the very end, Nietzsche writes in Twilight of the Idols, quote, a well-constituted human being, a happy one, must perform certain actions and instinctively shrinks from other actions. He transports the order of which he is a physiological representative into his relations with other human beings or with things. If I'm happy, if I'm affirmative, Nietzsche says, it doesn't mean that I'm an immoral bastard. It means that I have to act in certain ways because that's the kind of being I am, all right? because to act in another way would be shameful, would be, would, would, di would be, would be incompatible with what I am. Right? So affirmation has its own morality, is the point. Happiness has its own morality, I understood in Nietzsche's sense of what it is to be a happy or positive being, an affirmative being, All right? a noble being. The wager of micropolitics is that by working to constitute ourselves in certain ways, necessities of a political nature can follow. If these formations become genuinely rhizomatic, what they affirm is a pluralism, both as an ethics that feeds into politics and as a strategy of political engagement. To see the possibilities of forming ourselves as political animals in this way is a crucial payoff of Deleuze's thought, one that makes his thinking necessarily political, even if it does not present a political project as traditionally understood. Thank you.